Good afternoon. I'm Chris Zimmerman, Vice President for Economic Development at Smart Growth America here in Washington, D.C. And welcome to today's webinar, which is about form-based codes and small-scale manufacturing. Uh, before we begin, I do want to note a couple of things. One is that we will be taking some uh, questions uh, after the presentations. Uh, we will be doing that only through the chat facility, so uh, that's the text facility on the, the webinar, uh, and they'll be moderated here. Uh, I should also note that this is being recorded, and we will have the website available on the SGA website uh, sometime next week. I uh, also want to note that this is part of a program that uh, SGA has been uh, working on for a few years, thanks to the support and guidance of the Economic Development Administration at the U.S. Department of Commerce, uh, working in partnership with Recast City, uh, in which we've worked in a number of different places over the last uh, few years on small-scale manufacturing. Uh, I do want to note Smart Growth America, for those of you who may not be familiar, is a national nonprofit uh, with a mission that you see on your screen now. We are also known for a number of programs that have different names, uh, such as Transportation for America, the National Complete Streets Coalition, and the others you see there. I want to note in particular on the lower left, uh, FBCI is the Form Based Codes Institute, uh, which uh, is a great uh, source of information about Form Based Codes and has a number of programs you can find out about that also on the website. I mention this because it relates directly to uh, today's webinar. Uh, so with that, let me just say a couple things about what we've been doing and why. Uh, the interest that Smart Growth America has in small-scale manufacturing in the first place uh, has a lot to do with what's happening in economic development uh, in the country uh, now and for some years now, in which economic development is increasingly about placemaking. And we've been doing a lot of work with communities on place-based economic development, uh, which can cover a, a lot of different things. But this small-scale manufacturing has become an area of interest for that. Uh, another opportunity for communities, particularly those that uh, have a legacy of manufacture, that continue to have buildings uh, that uh, served larger manufacturing purposes one time, that who have a legacy of skills in their community, uh, and are looking for new ways uh, to bring life uh, to their towns. Uh, so we've worked for a number of years on uh, this issue under this program. Next slide, please. Uh, in which we're seeking to help uh, communities do a number of things, including making strategic land use decisions to, uh, to improve their, uh, their local economies, to help businesses, government, developers, and community members work together on these issues, and to foster environments that support entrepreneurship and homegrown industries, to create jobs that demand a variety of different education and skill levels, and uh, pay good wages. Uh, so that's all the, in general what the uh, project has been about. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, if you, uh, you see the map, these are the communities that we have worked with over the past couple of years. Uh, Ten of them, four in the first phase, six in the second phase. Uh, just to give you an idea that it is around the country and in very different environments from uh, large cities to very small towns. Next slide. Today's webinar is going to focus on the question of how form-based codes can support and encourage small-scale manufacturing. One of the things we found as we work with communities uh, on this issue is that in many cases, uh, communities have a good uh, set of buildings and people with skills and entrepreneurship and, and want to do uh, small-scale manufacturing as part of a place-based economic development strategy. But often, one of the biggest barriers are the codes that the community has in place itself, the uh, existing zoning uh, does not necessarily allow some of these activities, uh, and uh, many times the regulations and, and the way in which we approach uh, land use and uh, development decisions may not be uh, particularly supportive of these, uh, these kind of activities. So uh, we're looking for tools and for ways that communities can uh, better take advantage of the opportunity, and one of the potential tools uh, is form-based codes. And so we have a panel today that uh, is going to discuss a little bit about how this approach to zoning or land use regulation uh, can help to foster uh, this kind of effort at economic development. We'll be hearing from three folks. Uh, Jeff Farrell is with uh, the urban design and towning plan firm Farrell Madden. Mike Brennan is president of Near Southside Incorporated in Fort Worth, Texas. And Dan Bartman is a senior planner at the Mayor's Office of Strategic Planning and Community Development in Somerville, Massachusetts. So we're going to start first with a kind of a broad overview that Jeff Farrell is going to give us. And uh, then we're going to hear the two examples from 
uh, Texas and from Massachusetts, and then we will open it up to questions and discussion. So now I'm going to turn things over to Jeff Farrell. Oh, I'm sorry. Before I do that, let me just say a couple of things um, before I go to Jeff. I uh, did want to say a little bit because we know that folks on the line may or may not be familiar with form-based codes, so I, I should say something about that. Uh, the zoning codes, as I said, that we've used in the past and most places in this country still have in, in force uh, are based largely on separation of uses and are often not oriented toward what was traditional town development. Form-based codes uh, provide a different regulatory framework, a, a set of standards that can be used both for public and private development uh, in just a district or across a town uh, to basically help a community realize a vision uh, that is uh, essentially traditional town development. That is to say, the walkable environment uh, that can support a, a mixed use, uh, a mixed use set of developments. Uh, to contrast that with uh, the traditional kind of uh, zoning that we've had for uh, the last 60, 70 years in most places. Uh, that's something that has been focused, as I said, on separation of uses. So we have areas that are uh, for industrial use, for commercial use, for residential uh, or institutional, and they're all separated and only connected really by arterial roads that require an uh, automobile to get from one to another. Um, by contrast, form-based coding attempts to get back to, again, sort of more traditional patterns of development that are more mixed use, more compact. And if you look at the pictures on the bottom, I think that's kind of the uh, you know, the, the simplest way of understanding the difference. Uh, what you see on the lower left there is the kind of thing that is generally allowed by zoning codes. Um, and in this case, you see something which does have a sidewalk, so it's in some sense theoretically walkable, but it isn't really a place people would want to walk by. Uh, the picture on the right shows the kind of thing that is uh, typically uh, r the result of form-based codes where you have a permeable facade where there's an interaction between what's going on in the building and on the street and is a much more inviting uh, environment for people to walk in. Uh, so with that as a very brief intro to what form-based codes are about, uh, I'll turn it to an expert on SAME in Jeff Farrell. Thank you, Chris. All right, I have to work out the machinery. Uh, a lot of things that would be great and that we'd love to see on a, on a modern Main Street are excluded or zoned out by what I'd call the excessive categories of conventional zoning. Uh, things that just don't make, certain things don't make sense. Uh, task one is, is permitting this great variety. Task two is about protecting and fostering the things that are necessary to a healthy city but can't compete dollar for dollar. We're gonna, we'll talk about that more later. Uh, this is what conventional zoning gets us. We don't want that anymore. Uh, this is, uh, I would call this a 21st century city or a timeless city. This is what we want. It's kind of messy, it's dynamic, it's varied, and don't forget it's small scale. A uh, quick point, we should not be micromanaging what happens at the small scale along these streets, especially not to exclude good variety. And I'd point out two things here. Uh, one, the, the page, the grouping of photos on the right, that's uh, from... One of our form-based codes, the intent page, giving an idea of what is desired and the kind of thing you're looking for on a retail street. And then look at the picture on the bottom right. That's a, that's a new car dealership where they have the new cars in a storefront. So a lot of different things happen in a storefront. We need to permit this variety. However, it's not to say that anything goes, but let's Let's remember 21st century technologies permit a lot more mixing and a lot more that is more mixed, more possible, and more productive. Um, this is a, an example. This is a use table. Yes, form-based codes do deal with uses. This is from one of our, uh, one of our codes. I think it's uh, the Norman, Oklahoma Center City. But form-based codes are about collapsing what is sometimes an ex, uh, a kind of comically extensive use, hyper-specific listing of uses, collapsing those into broad categories. As an example, we worked on a code in uh, Peoria, Illinois. Uh, at the onset, they had 75 pages, lists, 75 pages long of really specific uses. Uh, at the end, we got that down to two pages. 
That's, an, that's the kind of things you try and do. Um, in, uh, on the left, and it's a little covered over by the big banner, improper urban form and scale, uh, never forget all of this I'm talking about, being permissive about uses, allowing a lot broader variety, only works uh, when you're also keeping in mind that these things are small scale and they fit on an, on an urban street. But on the left, you can see a little bit the approach of form-based codes, which is broad categories. There is thinking about what happens on the ground floor versus the upper floors. On the right, you can see behind that banner, uh, zoning symbiology where uses become so sliced and diced into such small categories, uh, it's hard to keep track of them. That's, I would say, the broad categories on the left are a modern approach. On the right, that's, uh, that's the way we used to do it, and it's generated a lot of problems for us. Switching on to the second, which is about protecting those things, the functions that are needed to make a city work. Uh, I'll start out, and I'm not going to talk about affordable housing or, or inclusionary zoning, but it's a good example of something. If you don't have that in a city, you're not going to have a good city. It's highly problematic without that. Clearly, it can't compete dollar for dollar with uh, what I might say, with tongue-in-cheek, are condominiums that are going to be market, marketed to uh, yuppies or hipsters. Um, the city has to specifically protect those things. What I would call maker spaces or workshop places are, are in that same, they have that same problem, uh, whether it's ranging from a kind of uh, artisanal production to auto repair uh, to really light industrial things. Those are necessary to the functioning of a city, but you can't leave it up just to the market because when an area becomes hot, they will be priced out by uh, a little bit simplistically, the condos. You need to specifically protect those things and give them a place in the city. Uh, first example, this is a, a, a project. This is Overland Park, Kansas. This is a, a form-based code applied to their uh, small downtown. Um, and this is a, it was an existing condition. We found uh, about half a block off their, their main street there was an area of that was a, and I mean this in the best way, a kind of a motley crew of maker places. There was the building on you see in the lower right. This was a, a business that started off doing silk screening and t silk screening T-shirts, and they grew into a larger clothing manufacturer called Camp David. But on the same street, there is a, an auto body frame shop, a culinary school, and a couple of other businesses. What they have in common is uh, they're very small-scale maker places. Uh, the form-based code we wrote, and you're looking at what is essentially the zoning map for that, that gray street uh, right off Santa Fe Drive, that's a place that is made and preserved where that kind of activity is encouraged to happen and also protected, by the way. Uh, going up to the big scale, Peoria, Illinois, this is the warehouse district. Uh, if you were standing in this view, Archer Daniels Midland would be behind you, a major Midwestern manufacturer. Oop. This is the final. This was an area of, as you can see, massive industrial warehouse and, and uh, manufacturing businesses. They were starting to meet with an influx of mixed use, residential, uh, et cetera. The, this project was about um, allowing that to happen in a good way, but ensuring that the newcomers weren't able to push out the existing industrial and all the industrial uses were able to continue in operation as long as they could. So this was about both the form of the new stuff, getting it with good retail frontages and good streets, but also ensuring that the politics and the policy were there to protect those in, existing industrial uses. And third example, this is a project that is creating a new district for jobs, frankly. This is Beaufort, North Carolina. And uh, the, the gray streets you see in the middle of this project are specifically zoned for uh, almost 
not literally no residential or retail, but very minimal residential or retail are allowed within uh, a broad category of light industrial manufacturing. This is an area that was trying to capitalize on uh, ecotourism and the marine industry, which are closely related. Um, I would also say this is not solely for that use. The blue and the orange red frontages, the streets you see around that, those were more conventional mixed use uh, new urban development. And here's a, a couple of bits from the code. The right hand side of the screen is showing that intent page for what we're calling the tech work frontage. Uh, the kinds of things, these are places small to medium scale where uh, there's a civic front to the building, but what happens behind the building is work gets done. So the uses are very broad, industrial, commercial, and if you uh, were to redefine print on this, there's a very tiny amount of uh, residential or, or retail allowed so that that large landmass might have a place where people can get lunch and possibly uh, it would allow someone who was working on something downstairs to have a place to sleep upstairs. But very much about making a place for, uh, in the words of the local uh, mayor and planning director, jobs. And uh, I guess in, in our words, maker places of medium to small scale. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, and let me remind folks that we will be taking questions uh, through the chat facility. So if you want to be thinking about your questions and send them on in, uh, we'll try to get to them uh, after the presentations are completed. At this point now, we're going to go to a specific example uh, and hear about uh, what Near Southside Inc. is doing in Fort Worth, Texas from Mike Brennan. Mike? Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you from Fort Worth, uh, Fort Worth near Southside. Uh, I start off with this slide. This is a, a, a cover shot of our annual progress report. So I would direct any of you that are interested um, at the end of the webinar to visit our website at www.nearsouthsidefw.org. You'll be able to download a copy of this progress report as well as the form-based code that I'll be, I'll be talking about. A little bit about our organization. We are a uh, 501c4 nonprofit community and economic development group. We've been around for the last 23 years. We work closely with the city of Fort Worth. Um, my background, I'm a, I'm a planner and worked with the city of Fort Worth before jumping over to this organization. I uh, served as planning director for uh, Near Southside Inc. for 12 years before um, stepping into the president's role where I've been for the last uh, about 14 months now. And um, we are, on the next slide, you'll see that the location of our district is just south of downtown. So this is a, an aerial of the, the urban core of Fort Worth and very typical of downtown adjacent districts um, like ours. We had a streetcar connectivity to the downtown. We were sort of the first streetcar suburb, but much more than residential at, at its inception. And so we had, always have had a mix of um, people living here, institutional uses, schools, hospitals, and so forth. And the next slide shows this view that's sort of at the tail end of the near south side's first heyday, which, you know, prior to World War II, this is when we had the streets were, you know, the, the public space we had streets that were designed to accommodate originally streetcars. So you can see kind of a sign of things to come here in the foreground of the photo. You, you see that the streetcar tracks have already been removed and you can see them close to removal in the next phase as you, as you go down what is Hemp Hill Street. And what happened in those decades following that, you saw that this was a typical scene. Great old buildings that are well past their heyday, vacant, underutilized. But through the work of uh, dedicated uh, preservationists, developers, working with our organization, you had success stories like you see here with the, the renovation, adaptive reuse of these great old buildings. So we have seen some success stories that are gaining recognition. And the, the most, 
um, well-known example. On the next slide, you see this is the before photo. <laughs> this is Magnolia Avenue, which is right in the heart of our district, kind of the, the main street for the near south side. Uh, but you can see as in this photo that that main street environment changed over the years to something that was just a, a conveyor of, of traffic. And yet the next slide shows that it is now a, it is the spot for community activity. And you can see in this photo that it's really characterized by these old buildings that have now a second life. And so when we were first working towards uh, these success stories that eventually um, this was recognized by the American Planning Association as a great place in America. So that's sort of a testament to all of the work. But when you jump back to the, uh, the vision that, that ended up leading to this success, um, we started with a district that is really a collection of sub-districts. And we are home to the major medical campuses in Fort Worth. So we've got two big pockets of the district, our medical district west, medical district east. Now, unlike other cities that have these medical centers, ours are, they are, you know, integrated completely into that same street grid. So they're right down the street from the heart of Magnolia Avenue and all the restaurants and, and businesses there. But as you can see with this diagram, the challenge was to come up with a set of rules that would strengthen the existing character, allow for existing businesses to continue to thrive, but still play defense against development that's incompatible um, and uh, promote reinvestment throughout the en entire, entire district. So we put together a plan, and this, this plan that I update annually is the latest iteration of uh, the plan that dates back to the mid-90s. And so you can see this is a combination of a future land use map and there's some regulatory boundaries. We administer a TIF district and, and we've got the boundary of the form-based form -based code on this map as well. But you can see just looking at the land use classifications, in gray are the medical campuses which take up a significant share but everything else, whether it's the lighter yellow or the, or the, the darker orange, all of that is a mixed-use environment where those, those goals that Chris and Jeff were talking about of trying to allow that mix, residential, commercial, light industrial, um, that was critical. That was how it used to be. Unfortunately, the zoning did not match that vision and those goals. So. On the next slide, you'll see the, the cover of our form-based code that's been in place now since January of 2008. And so now we have over a decade of demonstrated development and uh, adaptive reuse examples complying with this new set of rules. Now, when we crafted it, we knew that we had to do something that was different than the conventional zoning approach that the rest of the, the city of Fort Worth had taken. So we, we used the, the smart code as the model and the transect um, as our organizational structure. And for those of you that are familiar with the, with the transect, you'll know that you know, it's really a continuum of development patterns from you know, rural preserve, ec you know, uh, ecological preserve, to all the way to high density downtown. And so within that transect, our area is the closest match for the T4 and T5 zones within the, the transect. So you, you can see that uh, in the previous slide, we were, if we could jump back to that slide, you'll see that just this excerpt from our zoning map, you'll see a combination of T4 districts, T5, and generally what we are trying to do is to match not only the um, existing or, or ideal land uses for those areas, but also um, build off of the zoning rules that were in place. And in some of these locations, we already had some established industrial or high intensity commercial uses. So we used the transect, we established uh, this zoning code, and I'll jump to the, to the land use table here on the, the next slide. And the, I apologize, the headings are, are cut off here, but basically you have T4, in the left column with 
looks like four permitted uses from the light industrial category, and then the T5 allows more. But even in that T4 classification, you have the, the light small-scale manufacturing uh, uses allowed. So flash forward to today and how successful has it been in attracting or retaining those types of uses. So I just put together some, some photo examples to, to demonstrate what we're, what we're seeing and as well as what we're, what we're still trying to get. So we have, have had success with um, attracting and retaining the creative community, which has always been really the, the heart, the cultural heart of our district. This is the part of Fort Worth, Fort Worth in general not known as, you know, it's not known like Austin is as this, this major creative hub, but within our district, that's, that's the environment that we have and we're fortunate to have that. So we have great examples of, uh, for, in this case, Seneca Studios, a glass art school and active studio doing work that is not going to fit into your typical neighborhood commercial zoning classification. We have other examples where same type of creative efforts, film, video, and music production. Now, what's happening is that these companies are finding these great old spaces in these buildings that used to be warehouses or manufacturing buildings. and while generally it's you know making movies and filming commercials and that sort of thing, that whole industry is is evolving so quickly that we wanted to make sure that the buildings and the regulations are set up for those uses to evolve without any concern that you know hey they're going to start doing something that's not in compliance with the zoning code. So we've seen a cluster now of these creative firms and the next slide shows that we're starting to get media attention for that and so this was a, a tour that we gave of all of the studios of the near south side featured in the in the local newspaper like many districts we also are seeing interest from craft breweries so that is has become a destination the next slide shows that we actually, if you look at the near south side, the four dots just south of Interstate 30 there, um, we have a cluster of those craft breweries. Now, some are smaller scale, some are large, like Rar and Sons Brewery, a major brewing operation that is, uh, you know, goes beyond just the, the small scale type of maker space. Um, but those have become a destination for many visitors. And the next couple of slides show a, a transformation of buildings like this into, uh, you know, from a standard warehouse building into a destination craft brewery that is also not just the tasting room, but also where they're making the beer. So we have other examples right down the street from this one, old warehouse building. And notice that the street itself was not conducive to that type of synergy between the streetscape and what was going on in the building. Now we have the street fully reconstructed, rebuilt as a complete street that has sidewalks on both sides. And inside this building that now has new openings, we have the level of activity like you see on this, on this slide here. We have the other end of the, the alcohol spectrum on the production side or the distilleries. We have a couple of examples here where same sort of buildings with kind of an industrial and warehouse past have been uh, adapted. In this case, this is a fire station, so really a cool example of that turning into a distillery. In the same way, there have been some landmark manufacturing buildings that laid dormant for years. In this case, the OB Macaroni um, building, which was built in the 1880s. That has now entered its second life as the home to a coffee roaster ice cream, local ice cream company that's making their product there, an event center, and so just really this great mix that we're seeing in, the, in these buildings. Now, as the medical district, or the home to the medical district, we want to be attracting those tech-oriented, biotech-oriented manufacturing companies. So happy to say that this building, which is its first life uh, was in uh, warehouse, building materials, big loading dock uh, just off the, the left-hand side of this photo. 
and the next uh, iteration for this building is going to be the home to a biotech anchor that's a homegrown company, Exact Diagnostics. So what we've seen, and you'll, you'll notice that I've talked almost exclusively about older buildings that have been adaptively reused. And so that's where we're seeing the, the small-scale manufacturing companies, breweries, maker spaces, uh, creative firms. They're, they're finding homes in these older buildings. What we haven't seen yet is new construction that is targeting those types of spaces. Generally with new construction, we will see that they're going for the, the tenants that uh, might be paying a higher rent, so retail, medical office, that types of, those types of tenants. So what it will take, in addition to these zoning regulations that allow these spaces to be used for those purposes, it will take um, more creative use of incentives, which we're working with the city to do that. Um, Finally, I'll wrap up just with another shot of our uh, annual progress report to let you all know that if you're interested in the full story, this is just a quick snapshot of, of things going on in uh, the near south side. Go to the website, download this progress report, and shoot us a note, and I'd be glad to, to help uh, anybody that's dealing with uh, similar circumstances. With that, I will hand back to, to Chris to um, intro Dan. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so from Texas, we're going to go up to the Northeast to Somerville, Massachusetts, and hear from Dan Bartman. Dan. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Yep, there we go. All right. So uh, thanks for having me. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of context in case anybody isn't familiar with Somerville. Um, we're a very small municipality, only 4.2 square miles uh, in eastern Massachusetts. If you take a look at the little key map for the state of Massachusetts, you can tell how how tiny we are, uh, but our uh, city hall is just 2.5 uh, miles from downtown Boston's city hall. You can see that us in the foreground there with the arrow uh, and downtown Boston in the background. Um, we are a highly walkable city that was built during the uh, streetcar era. Um, uh, we have that much of that to thank for, uh, for the mixed use nature of our community. Um, there is a good distribution of town and neighborhood centers uh, across the municipal or across the, the city, and um, we have a high rate of transit access. Um, we're undergoing a, a, one of the largest um, subway expansion projects uh, in the country, the Green Line Extension, uh, which will take us from uh, currently 15% uh, access to about 85% of the city. Um, uh, the city is probably most famous historically uh, for raising one of the first uh, American flags to chastise the British while they occupied downtown Boston back in the day. Uh, but today we like to uh, celebrate our, our um, our identity through through car, uh, our culture and arts and creative uh, things that we do here. Um, this is a picture of the Honk Festival, which is a festival of activist street bands that come from around the world uh, to perform in Somerville. Uh, we also host the largest porch fest in the country. Um, we actually stole this from uh, one of the cities that first invented it and uh, got it up and running and uh, had a larger, larger draw than they did. Uh, so we like to uh, show that off. Um, and of course, uh, the What the Fluff Festival is, celebrates the creation of Marshmallow Fluff, which uh, was made here in Union Square, one of our town centers. Uh, but one of the um, challenges with being a small community as part uh, of the larger Boston metropolitan region uh, is that there's immense pressure to develop as the uh, metropolitan region grows. Uh, Somerville is just a small part of it, and, uh, and we face a lot of challenges re related to um, expensive housing and, and the need for commercial space. So there's always uh, change looming. Uh, so in 2012, the city adopted its very first uh, comprehensive master plan um, named Summer Vision. Uh, this was passed two months after I joined the city as a senior planner. Uh, there are a number of objectives for the arts and creative economy. I'm not going to read all of this, but you can see in some of the highlighted words, uh, craft manufacturing, live work, incubator, startup, uh, design, music, film, multimedia, the, the uh, populace here that, that uh, worked on Summer Vision was very uh, focused on making sure that we didn't lose all of those creative things that, the, that they were uh, a part of um, as the city did change. 
uh, in reference, there are 584 total objectives in the summer vision, uh, and 76, around 13% of them um, were related to the arts and creative economy. Uh, but one of the reasons that I was hired is because 31% of them are about implementing uh, a new zoning ordinance. Um, this comprehensive plan is fairly expansive, and one of the first things I realized in coming on board was that uh, it wasn't going to be a, a, a pure form-based code. We were going to have to use all the tools in the toolkit and, uh, and produce a hybrid zoning ordinance. Uh, so when we looked to um, try to figure out a way to achieve most of the um, – uh, how many were there? Uh, 76 different uh, goals about uh, the arts and creative economy. Uh, we, we kind of came up with a three-pronged strategy. Uh, establish arts and creative uses in our use table, uh, preserve and create new spaces for those uses, and then also permit art in our neighborhoods. Uh, we really think of these as uh, three pillars that can't be unwound from each other. We really need all three of them for this, this system to work. I'm going to talk about the first one, establish arts and creative enterprise uses. Um, uh, and, you know, as Jeff brought up earlier, um, you know, a lot of form-based codes still regulate uses. We're, we had to dip into um, the, you know, Euclidean zoning concepts. Um, that on the right here, you see the, the use table from the smart code. So I don't think there's a reason to fear this, especially if you come from a community that has a lot of economic development goals. Um, I, I think that uh, Jeff brought up the excessive categories of conventional zoning, and I think that what we did was try to figure out a way to, to use that concept to our advantage. Uh, our first challenge was actually um, trying to wrap our minds around what all was included in the creative economy. Uh, and to figure that out, we turned to this document, The Creative Economy, A New Definition, published by the New England Foundation for the Arts, uh, and I believe in 2007. Uh, the goal for that was to establish a core definition of what is all included in the creative economy um, by researching all of the different types of industries that existed in New England. Uh, what they came up with on the left includes the production of goods and services um, through actually physical objects, tangible objects that can be trademarked, um, but also on the right, um, uh, intellectual innovations um, that can be uh, copywritten, patented, or trademarked, um, and they considered this to be a, a broader definition than what most artists would like you to um, to consider in, in protecting them through zoning, which I put, I put a bullseye here. Um, you know, most, most people who are painters or sculptors or uh, framers, things like that, excuse me, things like that, um, all fall within this portion on the left-hand side uh, that would be defined as the cultural core. Um, so this whole, this whole concept here focuses on uh, the production and distribution of goods, services, and intellectual property. And we decided that uh, that was the um, perspective that our zoning ordinance was going to have to have um, because we, needed to, we wanted to support the broader uh, creative economy and not just, not just focus on people that were um, producing physical objects. Um, we, we created, uh, I believe, six use categories um, based off of that document. Uh, the first one was artisan production. Uh, this covers everything from, uh, you know, people making clothing, the breweries, uh, people that make food and sell it, might s maybe sell it on site, furniture makers, glass blowers, jewelry makers, everything of that sort uh, that, that really is, um, falls on the tangible side of objects. Um, uh, arts exhibition, which covers everything from assembly halls and auditoriums, theaters, gallery spaces, um, and everything. You'll notice I routinely use, uh, in, the, in the red text that I highlight, I re routinely use the term or their substantial equivalents. Uh, that's actually a, um, a test that the courts will recognize um, how to utilize um, if there's ever a challenge uh, related to these items in court. Um, so they'll, they'll judge whether or not uses fit within these categories by understanding um, their impacts and the ways they operate um, and decide whether or not they are substantially equivalent or not, um, again, if this is ever challenged. Uh, art sales and service, uh, this one's fairly obvious. This is, uh, obvious. This is a picture of a, of a Blick art supply store, um, but all your print, print shops, set design studios, uh, galleries, things like that fall within art sales and services. Uh, design services, this is um, pr pretty much uh, everybody that might be on this phone call is probably involved in one of, one of these uh, industries, architectural design, interior design, industrial design, landscape architecture, urban design, and their substantial equivalents. Shared workspaces and arts education. Um, these are larger, typically larger buildings and um, uh, firms uh, that, pr like for instance, art centers, uh, creative incubators, culinary incubators, uh, design and fabrication centers. Uh, this is a, actually a picture of Artisans Asylum, which uh, allows 
various members of the community to come and rent uh, heavy machinery to build things uh, that they don't, so they don't have to buy and ha have those things themselves. Um, also Fab Labs, uh, that's something that uh, MIT, uh, which is just in our backyard, uh, has spun out recently. So all of these are included in our category called Shared Workspaces and Arts Education. And then the last one is co-working, which includes everything from artist studios, uh, office suites, everybody hot desking, uh, especially if they're from the arts and creative economy, uh, various industries. Um, so we took these six uh, line items and added them to our use table, which you can see on the left-hand side here. Um, and the real, uh, the real thing that I think is valuable to, to realize is that all of these could just be items that you see on the right-hand side from uh, a more general use category, assembly and entertainment, educational services, general office uses, consumer goods, um, manufacturing, all of those things, all, all of these arts uses that I just uh, read off can fit within those categories, but we're specifically calling them out to be different on, uh, for a specific purpose. Um, and you know, one of the challenges uh, that is related to that, there's no reason to call these out if all of the other items on your list are also um, permitted. You can see the, the letter P here means that everything's permitted by right in these districts. Uh, and that's why we believe the second pillar um, of our strategy was also very important. We needed to create a district to preserve and create spaces uh, for these uses to occupy. Uh, the best story that I can tell you is related to the firm uh, iRobot that invented the Roomba. Uh, they started in Somerville, but when, their, um, when the Roomba took off, uh, they actually had to move outside, um, outside the city um, north of uh, the Burlington Mall to find enough office space for their growing business. Um, and story uh, af after story like that was happening with uh, arts and creative economy uses uh, in Somerville. And they were, um, and it actually instigated the, the formation of a, this organization called Space Equals Work that was uh, an advocate um, for, for preserving and expanding artists and, and industrial spaces in the city. And they were very involved uh, when we were working on our first um, iteration of our zoning ordinance, or the new zoning ordinance that I was hired to write. Um, they cited buildings that existed in the community uh, that we needed to protect and preserve. Uh, for instance, the Rogers Foam Factory that is uh, maybe famous uh, from producing Nerf balls for the Parker Brothers, um, uh, but is now the uh, Vernon Street Studios with a, 152 different artists occupying that space. Um, this is a, f a photo of the New England Baking Company factory, which now has 62 artist studios and 15 individual commercial suites in their building. Uh, this is a, a diagram of a complex of buildings that was the old Ames Envelope Company factory um, that is now called the Ames Business Park. Uh, in there are 21 different businesses, um, and there are four here that we consider really important. Uh, they're also labeled here. Greentown Labs is the largest clean tech incubator in the world. Um, they probably have 30 to 40 small businesses that they are currently incubating and spinning out um, on a, on a semi-regular basis. Uh, that that cre is a huge driver for space uh, uh, engineer for the need for space in other areas of Somerville. Um, uh, also Artisans Asylum, which is right next to the MIT uh, location. Uh, they are a fabrication center that I brought up earlier. Uh, Brooklyn Boulders, uh, which actually opened up their second location. Uh, they first started in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, it's about 40,000 square feet climbing gym, but also a collaborative workspace uh, for individual individuals and small firms. And then, of course, uh, Aeronaut Brewing, one of the largest breweries in Somerville. Um, they operate a tap room and food hub here. Uh, there's a no um, number of small little businesses inside their space, um, including a, a chocolatier and a, and a little restaurant um, that's uh, fairly high end, actually. Um, but you can see the, the level of uh, uh, interesting things that are happening in this complex. Um, so we, we wanted to make sure that we uh, uh, created a district that would uh, protect these buildings. Uh, we invented that in our, in our new form-based code. Called, we called it the Fabrication District. It has one building type permitted. It's fairly permissive. We called it the Fabrication Building. Uh, in its definition, it, it cites things like having tall ceilings, expensive win expansive windows, wide corridors, service elevators, and loading docks. These are you know, building features that, that allow these uses to actually function properly in these types of buildings. Um, they ha like I brought up a minute ago, they have uh, fairly generous uh, dimensional standards. 
um, almost every building in the in this district will will fit within this uh, this envelope. Uh, but the value in this is that we correlated that building type in this district uh, with those uses that I brought up earlier. So you can see in these columns uh, all of the arts and creative enterprise uses with a a couple supporting industries. Um, uh, our use table is actually five pages long. We took it from uh, 300, over 300 uses in our, in our original code down to about 90. Um, so there, you know, there's, there's some here outside of the arts and creative enterprise uses that are also permitted in the district, but it's primarily oriented towards those uses. Um, this is what it looks like when applied to a zoning map. Uh, the, the Ames Business Park is below the number 14 uh, on this map. Um, and so you can see actually how mixed use the community is. Uh, you're, the, you know, the different purple districts are all mid-rise districts that are mixed use, uh, and uh, the, the yellow and orange district is different scales of residential development. All of them, none of them are single, single unit. Um, so we uh, we haven't uh, we never fell into this into that same problem that some other cities have are, are now repealing and getting rid of single use zoning or single family zoning. Um, so we, we haven't really feared the idea that, that not allowing uh, a broad array of uses in our fabrication district will make the community inherently less walkable because uh, of how fine-grained our zoning map is. Um, but the big challenge here is that uh, the fabrication district doesn't really cover much of our 4.2 square miles, um, which brings us to the third pillar of our strategy, permit art in the neighborhoods. Um, so if you go back and look at that, that map again and add in our, our largest neighborhood or uh, residential district called Neighborhood Residents, uh, that, that adds about 80% of the land area of the city back onto the map. If you correlate this uh, with the map of our Open Studios event that happens annually, uh, you'll notice that a lot of these uh, little numbered uh, art studios that are, are embedded in the neighborhood areas. So if you, you know, flip back and forth, you can see how much that's distributed in the yellow areas of the, of the community. Um, so we knew that we ne also needed to allow these uses in our, in our two neighborhood districts. So we, we do that by special permit um, in any building that was built before the adoption of this ordinance for commercial purposes. Uh, and you can, uh, I had to cut off the, um, the list of uses, but um, it's all the creative, uh, arts and creative enterprise uses. Um, now the one thing that we also wanted to do was invent um, a special home occupation uh, that also covers all of these types of activities and make sure that those uses are allowed inside your own house or inside your carriage house. Um, uh, we do have a lot of these buildings. Um, uh, if you remember, I, I brought the, up that some of those development happened in the streetcar era. Uh, some of it was also built in the horse and buggy era. era. So um, there's a lot of these buildings out back that uh, can be reused for, for this, this type of purpose. The community is really supportive of the arts, and, uh, and a lot of this is actually happening before we ever wrote zoning that said it was allowed. Um, so they tend to accept these types of things in the neighborhood. So um, we wanted to make sure that both of these things were, were allowed in old buildings and, and within homes and carriage houses. Um, those were the three strategies that we put together, trying to, trying, uh, pretty much using um, you know, Euclidean use type zoning, uh, creating a building type uh, that was more form-based, um, but also incentiv incentivizing the protection of these buildings um, and, uh, and, and through, the, through the customized use table, um, making sure that these things don't leave the community. Um, now, I do want to tell a story related to um, the fact that we, we still can't jo stop, uh, well, I will call arts gentrification from happening, uh, even with these tools in place. Um, this is a pretty famous comic about how old buildings turn into uh, creative studios and then uh, cafes and then all of a sudden bohemian apartments. Um, and our effort, uh, we really think, stops the fourth, the fourth thing from happening here. Uh, if, if change is going to happen to our fabrication, uh, the buildings in our fabrication district, we want to make sure uh, that the creative hub slash cafe is the point where they, where they terminate. Uh, we did have an example of this that recently happened. Um, this building was a, a former soap factory. It's about 7,500 square feet. Uh, it was the home uh, to Fringe Union that had about 15 small creative businesses in an open concept. Um, and the property owner, um, this was wildly successful. It was actually one of the one of the buildings we went and took measurements from uh, to develop our our uh, fabrication building type. Uh, uh, that I brought up earlier, um, but the the property owner had come to us and actually wanted to propose uh, changing the building over to a residential apartment building, and um, 
prior to getting our um, ordinance adopted, we, uh, we actually, through a lot of arm twisting, convinced him uh, to just uh, up upgrade and renovate the building, but, but put forth the uh, best efforts to retain as much creative, arts and creative enterprise uses uh, in, in that building as they could. Um, about half of them stayed. Here's some photos of before and after. Um, so one of the things you'll notice is that the building became handicap accessible through the, uh, through the renovations. Um, it did end up losing a little bit of character here. You can see a, a, a community-made mural on the side of the building, um, and, and this is the existing condition now, but that is a shop front that's now facing that side street. So, you know, uh, we often talk about um, form-based codes making sure that the, the sidewalk feels walkable. Um, the, this is a place now that is a, maybe uh, – just as equally welcoming to the pedestrian as that that mural was, um, so we feel that this um, this this type of setup that we've come up with uh, using multiple different tools um, uh, will at least maintain these areas um, at, for arts and creative enterprise uses uh, in the face of ch of much change that we're uh, that we're facing as a as an inner core community uh, within metropolitan Boston, uh, and that's it. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we're going to open it now for some discussion and questions. And again, uh, if you want to submit your questions through the chat facility, Jerry Mincer of Smart Growth America is here moderating those, and she'll be uh, reading the first off in a few moments. But I'm going to take the prerogative to put the first question to the group. Uh, I'll start, um, and I'll turn first to Jeff Farrell, but uh, Dan and Mike be thinking if you have something you want to add to this. Uh, and the question is, is this. Uh, if you're looking at uh, helping to foster small-scale manufacturing, what would you say are the most important features of a form-based code that could help do that, uh, one, two, or three things that are the, you know, the most relevant to, uh, to fostering small-scale manufacturing? Jeff? Um, well, I, apologies for being contrary, but the, the first thing is I think you're talking about uh, you want, even if it's small-scale manufacturing, the, you want the buildings to have a front on the street. So, uh, so that's a, that's uh, eventually, in the long run, that's, that's definitely fostering because it makes a better environment for the workers. But um, you want to have, I think the biggest thing is, and it gets to another question I saw in the, on the chat screen someone asked, um, is you want to eliminate the competition. And <clears throat> Dan hit on this at, at the end of his talk. The biggest thing that will kill maker space and the small-scale manufacturing or medium-scale manufacturing is having to compete dollar for dollar with, to put it simplistically, condos. Um, so reserve this as a place for those uses. And it's a place where a good form-based code gets, wades right into the issue of uses, and you take those things off the table. Somebody can't come in and turn this makerspace into uh, condominiums. So the concern here is that in a hot market, uh, say residential is you know got a very high return on investment. Everything will turn into that if it's allowed, at least in the near term in a market. And so essentially, you're turning to use regulation as a way of it's preventing a, that from it's happening. A, it's a big part of it. So, uh, another aspect of it is you you make sure that the place is set up so that it can be serviced. That may be uh, you know preserving rear, healthy rear access in the center of the block, things like that. But I, I would add, as far as the uses go. I've been practicing town planning for, good Lord, it's now getting onto 30 years, I think, as I get older and older. And for my entire career, residential has beat the stuffing out of uh, industrial. Mike or Dan, you want to weigh in on this one? Either of you? Is, this is Dan. I, I uh, wholly support Jeff's, Jeff's comments. Uh, r residential here can pay three to four times the price per square foot. Uh, that some of these uses uh, can pay. So for, for us, uh, limiting res residential uses or, or even outright restricting them from the specific buildings that you're trying to save uh, or provide for these types of uses is hands down the number one thing. Um, uh, I think that there needs to be a place for these types of uh, activities in almost every municipality. Um, but w w in a hot market, residential will, will you know consume every single one of these buildings. Um, you, you know, you need to offset that by allowing higher density where it need, if, if your residential market is in high demand, then you need to provide a, a place for it to go um, because it will chew up these old buildings because they're the easiest ones to convert. 
I'll just I'll just add. This is Mike. Uh, this goes beyond the the code, but um, if you have access to a economic incentive tool, in our case, we use the the tax increment finance district to support some of those projects that are, you know, restoring old buildings, introducing spaces that, and uses that you know aren't top of the market type of uses. Um, we will use the TIF to reimburse them the cost of public improvements that are associated with their project, and in some cases actually, um, you know, pay for a facade easement that will give them an incentive over a number of years that helpfully, hopefully will allow that use to compete favorably with the, you know, maybe the more profitable use. We've, we've gotten very lucky, actually, I think we're sort of in a sweet spot where the locations where these creative firms and, and small scale manufacturing uh, uses are going are getting a lot of new construction residential. And so there's not as much pressure on these older buildings for conversion uh, to residential. Thanks. I, I think just to sum up, uh, there's often the misconception that form-based codes don't involve any regulation of use, uh, which of course is not the case. And in particular, I'd note that a standard feature of a form-based code is reserving space for retail because there are places we want to have retail on the street and so that is something that is specified. And in effect, what you, I think each of you are saying is code may have to do similar kinds of things for small-scale manufacturing if we want that to be part of the mix as well. Yes, we've gotten several questions about um, sort of performance standards or um, how, to, how to deal with impacts such as noise and um, pollution and things like that. And I think that your point gets to those, uh, several people have asked those questions. And external effects, of course, are you know, legitimate subjects of regulation and uh, most communities will include that if they adopt a form-based code, they're going to have some form of that as well. Uh, Jerry, you got uh, another question yes, from the audience? Yes, we do have some questions from the audience. So one of them is, um, does the light industrial work well with residential or commercial uses, or is it best to separate the small-scale manufacturing within a form-based code? Jeff, you want to start with that? Uh, the first thought is, the, the one-word answer is yes. Um, however, you need to have some place that's, that's protected for the small-scale manufacturing slash maker. Um, on the other hand, with the foreign-based code and, and the, the technical uh, standards, so you don't know, poison anyone or, um, or, uh, or do have some kind of noxious side effects from a, a maker space on a residence, I, I think it's fine to allow a, a wider variety within areas that are also going to be residential. Not all residential areas should be completely mixed, but there are a lot of places in a city where that kind of uh, uh, cohabitation uh, is is a fine is a fine thing because it is a city. Good, Mike or Dan, got any thoughts? I would just agree with that. Where where we have uh, in Fort Worth, we've got designated urban village type of areas where that mix is expected, you know, whether it's on the residential side or the commercial side. It, it, if you're living there, um, the expectation is that you know that you're right down the street or maybe above uh, a use that is going to have, you know, some level of activity that isn't found in a single family neighborhood. We have some other areas that are not urban villages that are designated as neighborhood zones within our form based code. And the expectation there is that it's predominantly a neighborhood. And although we don't exclude all industrial uses, those are generally falling under the T4 uh, use table. And so there is a more restrictive set of uses there. Very good. Jeff, for the thought? Well, just uh, uh, something to kind of uh, complicate the mix, something that we do pretty consistently in, and I'm talking in, in downtown areas, is we try and keep the retail at the street level, and that includes restaurants and bars, and it's always a discussion because people love the rooftop uh, restaurants and bars. But one thing we remind people, and it's, and it's a real discussion to have, it's a political choice, but one of the things we remind people is um, in, in a healthy downtown, you're going to have a heck of a lot of uh, residential on those upper stories. People are going to be living uh, up on the upper floors above the street, 
and you're going to create problems if someone is uh, is looking out their window and the adjacent building is a is a, a is a hop and bar scene that the music uh, plays at night. It's one thing if you go to Miami Beach and you get a you get a hotel on Ocean Drive, uh, you know you're not going to get any sleep. But the, remember, a healthy city is a place where people live. So there's a real logic to keeping certain activities down on the street. Jerry, you got another question? Yes, we have sort of two questions specifically about Somerville. Uh, so Dan, uh, does Union Square Somerville still have a requirement uh, for a percentage of art space? Uh, so we have, we're slowly adapting that out. Uh, not because we're getting rid of it, but because we're using an overlay district system um, to actually deliver that same standard uh, to more areas of the city. So it's not just Union Square specific anymore. Um, so the, co the comprehensive plan that I brought up earlier um, designates almost the entire eastern side of the city as areas to transform uh, with uh, you know large scale redevelopment. Um, a lot of a lot of those areas are, are underutilized, and um, part of the, the overlay district is to require that 5% of all commercial space, the total amount of commercial space in that in each sub-district is actually uh, reserved for arts and creative enterprise uses. So uh, I'd say we've expanded it, um, so it's not just Union Square specific anymore. Great, and then one more question about Somerville. Uh, do you have a buy right process for new use entitlement permits? Uh, or when does any discretionary review kick in for new entitlement permits? Uh, so we have um, uses are either by right or by special permit. Um, and one of the reasons that uh, the, the code has 90 uses still instead of like seven uh, is that we can apply standards to them in the ordinance um, that help deal with some of these compatibility issues that people were talking about. Um, so even the buy right ones still have rules. So um, if you're, let's say, um, uh, creative studio home occupation use, uh, there might be uh, limitations on the hours that you're allowed to practice your home occupation, be specifically because it could create noise uh, impacts to the neighbors. Um, so we still allow it by right, but there are rules to follow. Um, and I think, I think every use table kind of, even by right uses have that because you have to meet the definition of the use, right? So your operations specifically have to fall within however, you know, whatever box people create for, to define what a use is. Um, so we just consider all of these different maybe operational standards that go along with the definition uh, to be a part of that. So, um, so it's either by right or by special permit, but we do have uh, a significant amount of by right uses in the city. Thanks, Dan. Um, well, we're about out of time. I do want folks to know who've submitted questions that we couldn't get to that we will uh, take a look at all of them and uh, try to address them uh, through other means, uh, especially if you watch our blog. Jerry? Yes, we are going to post a, a recording of uh, this webinar and we'll also try to get some more answers to the questions we didn't have time to get to with an accompanying blog on our website, smartgrowthamerica.org, and that will be posted next week. Before we sign off, I do want to thank our participants, Jeff Farrell, uh, Mike Brennan and Dan Bartman. I also want to again thank uh, the Economic Development Administration and their National Te Technical Assistance Program for the support they've given uh, to this work over the last several years, as well as our partner, Alana Proust of Recast City. Again, you can look to our website in about a week and uh, find this uh, recording uh, if you need, want to review it further. Uh, if you have other questions uh, that we can be helpful, please feel free to contact us here at Smart Growth America, again, through our website, which is smartgrowthamerica.org. Uh, you can find out uh, lots of information about what we do and also how to contact us. Thank you all very much. Good afternoon.